Now, we are on this topic. We are the circumcision. We are the circumcision. Deuteronomy 10, 16, 36, and Philippians 3, 1 to 6. And shall we read? Deuteronomy 10, 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no longer uh, stiff-necked. And then Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6. And Jehovah your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. And then Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is indeed not grievous to me, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concession party. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now last week, we already looked at part one God as a covenant-keeping God. And we looked at the characteristic of God being a covenant-keeping God. We explored what is a divine covenant. The thing that is binding and unilateral. It is a covenant where his people come under the protection and reputation of his name. We also asked the question, what are the terms and stipulations of the covenant called? They are called statutes and judgment and laws and commandments. We explored what does God require of those called to be in covenantal relationship with him based on Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 14. He calls us to fear him, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him with all our hearts, to keep his commandments, to love others, to cleave or cling to him and to swear by his name. And then we examine what are some of the visible tokens of God's covenant. Noah was the rainbow. Abraham was circumcision. Moses was the Sabbath. David the perpetual throne. And Christ the communion cup. We then looked at what were the requirements of God's covenant with Abraham and his generation. Since we are looking at the whole matter of circumcision. And God required Moses, uh, Abraham, based on the Genesis 17 text, every male child must be circumcised. They must be circumcised on the eighth day. It must be kept in all generations. And those who were not circumcised were cut off from his people. We then move to part two, looking at the covenantal sign of circumcision. We define what is circumcision. And then we explored, are there health benefits from circumcision? We stop at point three. Is there a spiritual significance of physical circumcision? And yes, we understand from the scripture that circumcision was a permanent outward sign and a reminder to God's people that they are in covenantal relationship and God strategically place that sign at the heart of the male's sexual preoccupation. We want to continue and see how far we can go today. And uh, we are now covering number four. How was the term uncircumcised, figuratively and generally applied in the Jewish culture? Eliot's commentary made a very important point. This is what they said. According to the idiomatic expression, when you say someone was uncircumcised, it went beyond the physical circumcision of the male's foreskin. It became a cultural word referring to any imperfection which interfered with your efficiency. So if there was any imperfection that impacted on your function, on your purpose, they would say you are uncircumcised. So we give three examples. You have the expression uncircumcised lips. Now this was used in a normal, natural sense 
referring to the mouth. So that if someone had the inability to speak or they are rendered incapable of speaking because of some speech impediment, be it that they stutter and they cannot speak properly or cannot speak at all. The expression also speaks to that. It's a, it, it, it is a mouth that is not functioning according to its purpose. Uncircumcised lips. Let's follow our friend Moses. Moses claimed that he had a speech impediment and in, in, inadequacy. When God called Moses, and, um, and, and Moses said to Jehovah, Oh my Lord, I am not a man of words now. Now since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and I am slow of tongue. It's very interesting that when you study the life of Moses, you will discover before he left Egypt, the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 42, he was a man mighty in words and deeds. That's before he left Egypt. Learned in the arts of the Egyptians and mighty in words and deeds. He fled for his life and he became a shepherd for 40 years. And then God called him to go back and speak to the Israelites and to Pharaoh. 40 years after God called Moses and listened to our brother Moses. And Moses spoke before Jehovah saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? Since I have lips that are uncircumcised. Moses is building a case to God. And if you study the life of Moses, he's filled with excuses. When God called him. The same man was mighty in words and deeds. Forty years later when God says, I need you to go and speak to the children of Israel. I need you to go and speak to the Pharisees. <coughs> God, remember, I can't really talk. Send somebody else. This thought is repeated in verse 30. And Moses said before Jehovah, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh listen to me? Whenever God calls his people to do a task, sometimes look at what we cannot do in our own selves, and then we make excuses. But if God calls, God equips. If God calls you, he'll equip you. But of course, our sharing is not about the uncircumcised lips. So it's very, very important how God responded to this particular um, excuse of Moses in, 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 in verses 10 through to 12 of Exodus 4. And Moses said to Jehovah, Oh my Lord, I am not a man of words now. Now since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And Jehovah said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb? Or the deaf, or the seen, or the blind. It's not me, God. You see, we make excuse to God as if he's not aware of our inadequacies. He says, I, God, did that. And as a result, now go. And I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you shall say. So if God has called you for a purpose, quit making excuse, excuses about what you cannot do. The same Jehovah who calls says, I am the Lord God who made the mouth. I have known of, of men and women. We had Brother Darrell who came to a deliverance service. He said he couldn't even read. But God taught him to read. What God needs is availability. Someone who would say, God, here I am. This broken vessel, whatever you want to do with it. Rather than say, God, you know, I have uncircumcised lips. I just stutter. I can't talk. I can't do this. Then you have the expression, an uncircumcised air. This is an air that is rendered incapable of hearing and listening to God. An air that does not enjoy hearing the word of God. So when the word of God is declared or preached, there are some people, they become very, very uncomfortable. They prefer not to hear the word. And so, what does the Bible say in Jeremiah 6.10? To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are not circumcised. The NIV says their ears are closed. As the foreskin of a penis is closed before circumcision. Their ears are closed. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of Jehovah is to them a reproach. 
they have no delight in it. The, the uncircumcised lips, the uncircumcised hair. And then, of course, you have the uncircumcised heart, which is the point of our own discussion. A heart that is rendered incapable of understanding the things of God. A heart that refuses to believe, to love, to submit to God. A stubborn heart, a toxic heart. It is toxic because when you read Deuteronomy 30, God says, I want to circumcise your heart that you will live. The heart that is not circumcised breeds death, contamination, and illness. And so in Acts chapter 7 and verse 51, we listen to the sermon of Stephen. And Stephen says, O oh, stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so you do. So when a person is uncircumcised, both in heart and ears, they live in a darkened world, unresponsive to the word of Almighty God. So we are speaking now, part three, understanding the nature of the uncircumcised heart. We are not talking about the lips today. We are not talking about the air today. We are talking about circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Now, we need to understand the nature of this uncircumcised heart. What is the true nature of this uncircumcised heart? We must go to the word again. Jeremiah 17 verses 9 through to 10 gives you the best description of this uncircumcised heart. What does it say? The heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately nice. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. If you want to appreciate the true nature of the heart, digest Jeremiah 17. Let it soak in very deep. Inside of every human being, there is evil. So when you go home, go straight to the mirror and look at that person in the mirror. And quote Jeremiah 79 to him and her. As you look at Jeremiah 79, you would note the uncircumcised heart is deceitful above everything that exists. Church people, too? Deceitful above everything. What I know in our local expression, we say, but you're real deceitful. But part of our task as interpreters of the word is to go back to the original sense and not import modern day understanding. And so I went back to look at this word. Why is it described as what? Deceitful. The pulpit commentary says, the crooked devices of the human heart, which is characterized as deceitful, and it comes from a, a, a root word, literally uneven or rugged. You see, the deceitful heart is an unpredictable heart. You are anticipating that they will act in a particular way. But their heart is so rugged and uneven, they're swinging in all kinds of a direction. So you can't trust to say, today, tomorrow, this is what this person will do or say. This is how they will behave. Because they are rugged and uneven. Another understanding of this term deceitful by Fawcett Brown is that deceitful comes from the root word supplanting or tripping up insidiously by the heel. Which is the same expression used of Jacob when he swindled his brother. A trickster. The heart is a trickster. And so we explore this word supplanting to appreciate the full nature of the heart. When you talk about supplanting, you're talking about someone who is bent on displacing you. The word supplant conveys the idea someone who's planning a coup. 
That's what Jacob did with his brother. While his brother was out on the field, he was concocting a plan with his mother to deceive the father and brother. He is a supplanter. When his brother came home very hungry, Jacob calculated, wait, this is a good opportunity to get his boat right. A supplanter is an opportunist. They look for any crack or weakness in you and they will massacre you. Supplanting has to do with succeeding. It conveys the idea of replacing, unseating, superseding, usurping. So when the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things, it is referring to a condition or a disease that is seeking to supplant, usurp, replace, oust, Without the person knowing. You're not hearing me. Watch your back. This is the fear of politicians. As I was saying to someone recently, if you plan a coup, the people who coup with you will coup you. You could be laughing and smiling with someone, but in their minds, in their heart, they are devising ways to oust you, to get rid of you, to replace you. Politicians face that. We have people in the family you could be after your sister's husband, but she don't know. Be after your brother's wife, but he don't know. And you're smiling and laughing. You're trying to get close. There are some people on your job. They are very interested in what you're doing. Because in their heart, they are seeing themselves sitting where you are sitting. Not everybody who comes up and says, oh, I like what you're doing. Uh -uh. Now, now, don't get all paranoid and call witch when no witch is there. And you leave this service looking all. But the deceitful heart is a heart that is bent on getting rid of. One man put it this way. Don't fear the enemy that attacks you. But the fake friends that hugs you. Another person put it like this. Make sure everybody in your boat is rowing. And not drilling holes when you're not looking. God hasn't called us to be cynical about life, but to be wise. The Bible says of Jesus in John, he did not commit himself to all men because he knew what was in man. So I relate to you, but you must, if you're going to survive, hold back parts of yourself. So you could understand then what God says in Jeremiah chapter 17 and 5. He says, so says Jehovah, curse is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arms. You see, we depend on people, but you don't throw your whole weight. You must live with an expectation that any number could play from this social animal called man. Understand the nature of this, this thing called the heart. And so God warns. But I have a look at something for you. While I was speaking earlier, most of you were thinking of somebody else and not yourself. Some of you even went down memory lane and think of all of those wicked people you have met in church, in the office, at home. But this heart is so deceitful. The deception of our heart is so chronic. Now this is not on your script, so you could probably write it down. That we cannot even see the evil in ourselves. That's how deceitful the thing is. Here's what the word says in Proverbs 20 and verse 6. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man will. Just give us a few minutes. You'll, have to, you, you'll hear how we talk about our resume. Everybody want to rehearse all the good things they are. They are doing. I'm not a bad person, no. Everybody, we proclaim our own goodness. And notice what happens. We constantly sanitize our evil by our intention. So when it's called, we say, well, I really didn't mean it, you know. If you understand, I'm reading a book right now called The Lucifer Effect by Zimbardo. It's not reader friendly. It's very, very fine print. He's talking about why good people turn evil. Well, he, he has started from a psychological standpoint. From a biblical standpoint, we have a sinful nature. None of us like to hear about our faults. 
None of us like to hear about our sins. We all like to hear good things about ourselves, even if it is not true. But the heart is so deceitful. You can actually do a press release about yourself that's a lie, sit down, watch it, and then believe it. I want to repeat that. The heart is so deceitful. You could construct a press release about yourself, which is a lie, sit down, watch it, and then believe it. That's a definition for politics. <coughs> the extent of the thing, we see it in others, but we are deceived because we can't see it in ourselves. That's the nature of this. The deception of the heart of our heart is so chronic. We think we know more about ourselves, ourselves more than the Lord himself. Are you aware of that? I want you to follow this. But after I've risen again, says Jesus, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Though all shall be offended because of you. I'm watching your back. I will never be offended. You've never made that promise to you? I'm watching your back. You can depend on me. Everybody else, you see. But then Jesus said to him, Truly, I say unto you that this night, before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. Now, listen, listen to Peter. All will do it except me. You see, because, you see, everybody else, them have issues. Everybody else have issues. Everybody else came from a dysfunctional family, but my own. When Jesus said that to Peter, listen to Peter. Peter said to him, though I should die with you, yet I will not deny you unto you, Jesus. And all the disciples chirp in. Yeah, 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 we too, we too. Because we actually believe we are not so bad even when the Lord pronounces a verdict on the condition of your heart. He says, Peter, you are going to do it. And he's saying, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. When it happened, all the disciples disappeared. Eh? Them same guy says, we too will watch your back, Jesus. And, and Peter now, he's, he's watching from afar to see how it could play. And there are a lot of people like that. They're not going to be with you in difficult times. They want to see how it will turn out. And then they say, oh gosh, you know, you know I already love you. you know. These people only turn up when things are going fine. Oh yeah, you were there arguing, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, set one on the right. The only position you want, benefits you want from this relationship. And Jesus says, huh? Are you able to drink the cup and it's a cup of suffering he was referring to. A lot of people, they want to reap the benefits and not the suffering. So I'm going to watch your back, Jesus. Listen, the Bible says when they identified Peter, he started to curse and swear. That's the same guy, right? That's the evil within. I was watching at the emphasis of the Greek construction. It basically says, I never saw that man in my born life. Now, you know, Jesus started his ministry in Galilee, up north. Now, the Galileans had a different country accent than the tongue folks in Jerusalem. So, in Matthew, it says, thy speech betrayed thee. In other words, your accent giving you away. You say you're not from there, but you're speaking like a Galilean. There's evil within us. Are we ready to confront it? Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. The present tense in the Greek for C is blepo. Blepo, I see. Luke used an emphatic form. He did use blepo. He used emblepo, which is a prefix meaning through. So when Jesus looked at Peter, it was, I am seeing through you, Peter. So the deception of the heart fools us into thinking that we could even challenge. And may I say to you, some of you who cannot forgive yourselves, is because of that deception. You can't believe you do that. But Jesus did. You see, we have ourselves so high that when we make blunders and mistakes and there's so much shame and disgrace, I don't know about you, all of us have a checkered history like a draft board. Some believers act as if they drop straight from heaven and you work over time to conceal your past. As a man, as a pastor, I have made blunders and mistakes along the way. And trust me, tomorrow I'll make some new ones. But I have to, I've got to learn to laugh at me, deal with me and say, boy, you're a human being like everybody else. 
and let God heal and restore you. A few days ago, I was chatting with, with a young minister. I said, listen, laugh at yourself. Defrost now. You're too tight. Let your verdict about yourself agree with the verdict of the Lord about you. You're not as nice as you think. I am not as nice as I think. You're not hearing me. And so forgive yourself. What have you done? Sometimes it's sexual behavior. Sometimes it's abortion. Sometimes it's lies. Sometimes it's blunders and seem to going to hit the fan. Come on, come on, come on. You are not bigger than God. If God chooses to forgive you, then release yourself. Release yourself. Be so nice. Eh? Tell you this. The deception of our hearts. It is so chronic. We go ballistic. When we hear what other people are saying about us. Forgetting we are all guilty of doing the same. Oh boy. Here's what the wise man Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7.21. Do not heed to everything that people say. Or you may hear your servants cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself curse others. You see we act high and mighty. That our heart is so clean. Jesus makes a statement. He says, woe is you if all men speak well of you. Deal with your psychology. Not everybody would like you. And there are some people, they have no cause. They just can't like you. You know, we have this, oh, this saying, my blood ain't take she. What that mean? I don't know. But I, I don't know. I don't know. Just something. Just something. My spirit ain't take you. May, may I say this to you? There is an evil going through the human heart. And if you keep, let's, let's, let's run it. Let's, let's do a, a, a normal church reality. Church is over. You didn't like what pastors say, how we look, how we dress, he bald head, whatever, whatever, whatever. Right? You hobble in a corner and you do your shingding. Not true? And when the word gets back to you, you mad with everybody. Body. I ain't going back there. I ain't lay, lay, lay. I ain't lay. How do you go do that? How do you do that? Hold on a while, please. Think when you were doing it. Do so in like so. Now you are the recipient of the tongue. We can't take it. So Solomon in all his wisdom, he says, listen to me. I live long enough. I had 300 wives and 700 porcupines. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean concubines. So when you hear stuff about yourself, pinch yourself. Say, you know what? I might be guilty of doing that too in some form or some fashion. So you live your life with an understanding that there's enough evil in all of us, but there's also enough good in all of us. And how do I balance that? So when you walk out of spaces, don't assume everybody will be clapping you. Oh, we love you. You're the best thing after sliced bread. The uncircumcised heart is desperately what? Wicked. That's the need. And cannot be known by any man. So do what you may. The scripture is clear that I, the Lord, is the one who will search the heart. Only God knows the dictates, the motivation of the human heart and spirit. So then, I looked at that in various versions. The English Revised says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. It's a sickness. That's the nature of it. The, the, the World English Bible says, it's exceedingly corrupt. Young's literal translation put it like this. Crooked is the heart above all things, and it is incurable. Do arrange the Bible, put it like this. The heart is perverse and unsearchable. Who could know it? You see, there are contours in this wickedness that only God knows. Parents would know. After a while with your children, you ask them what you want. Huh? You see, Jesus is pretty clear in Matthew 15. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles a man. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile the person. 
That is the verdict of the heart. So then, we must ask a critical question. How does the uncircumcised heart accomplish its wickedness? How? When I canvassed the scripture, I found a common thread running through the scripture. That there seemed to be an ongoing dialogue and relationship of deceit and wickedness between a man and his uncircumcised heart. A lot of stuff going on on the inside. Remember Peter calls the hidden man of the heart. So it's not seen. You are carrying it on. And we have the ability to mask our behavior. Mask our intention. What we're really thinking. Sometimes it's cultural. You know the Asian cultures, when they are embarrassed, they sometimes smile. And you miss that. You think they are complimenting you or happy. And it may be the opposite. So you have to understand the nature of this heart. That there's this constant dialogue. And look at this. The fool has said in his heart. So there's this dialogue going on on the inside. He says to you, do so and so. But his heart is not you. There's a disparity between what he's doing and what his heart is saying. The Edomite saying in his heart, who shall bring me down? Peter, why have you conceived in your heart? So the heart and the heart of man and the man, they are in constant relationship of evil and wickedness. The uncircumcised heart deceives its owners into believing lies about themselves, about others, and God. So when we say the heart is deceitful, we are thinking that the deceit is coming to us from the outside. The deceit of the heart starts with the owner of the heart where the heart deceives even us. That is the extent of the evil and the wickedness. I found this was cute. You listened to it again, didn't you? Yeah. Whenever the evil, deceitful heart speaks to us and we listen, there will be damage. So then, let me close on this. What are some of the deceitful dialogues of the circumcised heart because the heart is constantly speaking and there's some dialogues going on. There's the uncircumcised heart of atheism. Here's what the Bible says in Psalm 14.1. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. So he has come up within himself that God doesn't exist. This is a conversation with your foolish heart about the reality of the existence of God. So you talk to your heart and your heart talk back to you. I know God. Yeah, I know God in truth. What a conversation. Then there is the uncircumcised heart of polite social hypocrisy. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 6. Do not eat the bread of him who has an evil eye, nor desire dainty foods. He's mean. He's stingy. He's not nice. Don't eat the food. Not every time you go somewhere you eat. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, I want you to see the disconnect of his words and his behavior from what's on the inside. He's saying to you, eat and drink, enjoy yourself. But his heart said, when are you going home? That's what he's really saying. You come to that, eat out my food. And there are people like that. Because this particular conversation is a conversation with, 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 with your mean heart about people whose presence you pretend to enjoy entertaining, but you really want them to go in their yard. Come in, now, come in, no problem. Where you want me? Sit down here yeah, now, sit down. Say, oh God, you're going to take up my chairs. <laughs> you go some places and you're going to take off your shoes. No, 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 leave your shoes on. Eh, eh? When you leave, look at the commander to my place. He couldn't, so people have to tell you to leave your shoes. You're not hearing me. That's the conversation they had going on. So there are some people that look like, oh, welcome, nice to have you. But really and truly, there's the uncircumcised heart of pride. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau. And what they did, they lived in the cleft of the rocks. And they were arrogant, proud people. Treating their brother or their cousin Israel real badly. And so God raised up Obadiah to speak to that. And here's what God said to them in Obadiah 1.3. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Dwelling in the clefts of the rock, his dwelling is lofty. And listen what? Saying in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? 
Go ahead and brag. This is a conversation with your proud heart about your false sense of importance and security. This will never happen to me. Because a proud heart deceives its owner into thinking that you are secure, that you are well off. You see, when you ask that question, who shall bring us down, you're basically asking that to man, not God. For when God is ready to deal with the human heart, there's the uncircumcised heart of lust. But I say to you, that whosoever looks on at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery where? In his heart. Tell you how this works. This is a conversation with your lustful heart about your secret sexual fantasy. Nobody I know, you know. And I find church people have a way of lusting with decorum. We have a sophisticated way at watching at each other. Good Lord. We sometimes use the mechanism of prayer. Ah, so I'll do so. Let's pray, my sister. Let's pray. Oh, glory. And it's not Holy Ghost passing here, you know. You feel it was Holy Ghost I felt there? You understand what I'm saying? From pastor to convert, we conceal. So sometimes I could sit and watch at a sister or brother and lick my lips in my mind. So you and I, we could be carry on, carrying on sexual fantasies deep on the inside. The heart evil. And then there are some people who say, you know, I wish my, my husband was like you. And if you are in a place where you shouldn't be on the inside, you're in problems. But you see, after all, nobody knows, so it's harmless. It's something that's happening on the inside. It's a dialogue you're having with yourself about if, what, maybe, possibilities. The uncircumcised heart of unforgiveness. Here's what the Bible says. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also to you. Unless each one of you from where? Your heart forgive his brother their trespasses. This conversation by this wicked heart is a conversation with your unforgiving heart about people we act as if we are forgiven. I forgive you. I forg Anybody can say I forgive you. But test this. Every time you see that person, what goes on on the inside? Find your body set a tense. Huh? I see her coming so, but I go into a dip. Talk to me. But I could hug you up because pastor said to hug and greet one another. I love you with the love of the Lord. And we do all this stuff, but inside we're boiling. We still believe that you owe me something. And you're going to have to pay someday. So help me God. I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray. And then we pray these kind of imprecatory prayers. Oh God, break the hand, break the foot. Let the children be desolate. Let the womb be barren. Oh God, Father, you know, you know me, how I love you. Oh God, you know, I alone serving you. God, you know, I didn't intend to hurt so. But oh God, they misunderstand me. Oh God, kill them. But when I see them, when I see them now, brother, how you doing? You know, I just had you in thoughts. They ain't telling them what kind of thoughts you have. But you know, I just had you in thoughts. I really hope things work out with you, eh? You know, really, really, I'm praying for you, eh? That, you know, that, that things work out, you know, look out wicked. <laughs> There's the uncircumcised heart of lying. Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to do what? To lie. Why did you conceive this thing in your heart? My boy and his wife, they sat down and they concocted their plan and all came from the heart. This is a conversation with your lying heart about how to con the servants of God. You know the amount of people lie to ministers? But Peter says, you haven't lied to man. Because God who judges the heart heard the story, heard the mischief in all forms, in all fashion. Look at this. There's the, the uncircumcised heart of ulterior motives. You know that guy called Simon? Who tried to purchase the gift of God with money? Here's what Peter said to him. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. Therefore repent. This is a con conversation with your unrighteous heart. 
about disguising your self-serving intent with a cloak of spiritual ministry. And you guys who are worship ministers and musicians, you have to guard your heart against that. You all hear what I'm saying? You understand? When, young man, when you go to minister, there's a lot of religious language we use. Don't listen to me, just listen to the Lord. You lie, you want them to listen to you. You know, I just came to minister. We're going to have church. Yeah, it's a concert you're going to have. And when they line you up, who is going to sing first? You. You don't want to sing first. Why? Because the crowd not there, there yet. You're not hearing me? You want to minister when you have a bigger audience. You don't believe in Christian concert, the amount of juggling going on. As a hooter is like the March Gras. Which song you going to do first? The jumpy, jumpy one? Or the sat satirical um, and political? So when you come to sing, sister, hmm, it's a heart issue, you know, pastor. In the name of ministry. And, and guess how we know it? When you don't get the solo part, you vex with the whole church. I live in the choir. Because I had a better voice than they, 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 they. that don't happen by us, you see. <laughs> Finally, <clears throat> for today, the uncircumcised heart of unbelief. Here's what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews Take heed, brothers, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief that's departing from the Lord. But encourage one another daily. Look at this. This is a conversation with your doubting heart about the ability of God's word and whether God is worth serving. Stand with me.